Today is January 16th, and this is um, Energy Week with George Harvey and Tom Fennell. Hello. 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 And our guest today is Jason Cooper, who has been on before. In fact, he was our first guest. And he's come back for another um, treatment. <laughs> <laughs> So what I'm going to do, uh, just in case anybody doesn't know, I spend a couple of hours every day looking at the news, maintaining a blog, which is called geoharvey.wordpress.com, and you can go to it and see daily news there, and if you follow it, the news will get emailed to you uh, from the blog site. And um, what, I, what I get is a lot of news, and I am able to see the trends developing as a result of that. I go through probably upwards of 100,000 news headlines every year. And um, I put about 8 to eight to 15, 10 to 15 on the, on the uh, blog every day, which is, if you think about it, that's a lot. That's several thousand a year. And what, I, what we're doing here is just talking about the news of the last week that I think is, in, is especially important. And this comes in chronologically. So our first item here is from January 10th. And it is, the U.S. Department of Transportation has issued an unprecedented safety alert on the transport of hydraulically fractured oil from North Dakota's booming Bakken oil fields that could also cool Canada's unconventional oil rush. And this was, the, the oil that they're getting out of this field has got too much gas dissolved in it. And that was the reason, apparently, why that train crash in Canada a couple of, mil a couple of uh, year, uh, months ago killed 45 people or 47 people, whatever it was, because the ca cars exploded. Because when they derailed, mm -hmm. the, the oil in them was full of, you know, it was like a pop bottle getting shaken up and, and bursting, you know. And it was a, it was a horrible mess. <coughs> We've had other problems with that too. So now they're saying, Fracked oil is not good for your health. Duh. <laughs> <laughs> In another way, it yeah. is not. Yes. And another one, which is in a, in a weird kind of way similar, um, there was an oil spill in West Virginia. There, I'm sorry, a chemical spill in West Virginia. Got into the water systems of nine counties with the result that three, 300,000 people lost the use of their tap water for all purposes other than flushing toilets. You can't even wash with this stuff safely. You can't even wash your clothes with it safely. And the chemical, why was it there? To clean coal. So clean coal, you know, and it just struck me. If you look at the fossil fuel industry, you're playing with chemicals. If you look at the nuclear industry, you're playing with different chemicals that are potentially different kinds of problems. When you're looking at the wind industry or the solar industry, you're playing with chemicals, but not on the field. They're only in the manufacturing. So, now since you guys are gonna to refuse to comment on that one, I will just go on, <laughs> January 11th. <laughs> I will add something right now. What's that? I don't know if you guys follow Zippy the Pinhead. No. But the residents of Dingberg right now are knee-deep in Valvoline. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, actually, I wanted to make a comment on that. It reminds me of uh, people who are talking about nuclear power and saying how 100% clean it is. Well, it is 100% clean if you ignore the waste. <laughs> and it's, so now they're making clean coal. Uh, Less emissions, that's great, and it's much cleaner if you ignore the waste byproduct of it. Yes. So, you know, what are the byproducts? Well, you've got coal ash. Mm -hmm. And coal ash has got a bunch of problems, not the least of which is that it's radioactive. Really? Yes. <laughs> There's, I, I don't know what it, what it is that's in the coal ash. I suspect it's thorium. Thorium is a very, very, very common element in nature. It's radioactive. It's the, the reason why we have radon in our basements around here. Um, it's in granite. It's in many stones. And it has a very long term, uh, it's a very long half-life. Half I, I, I think it's 14 billion years, half-life. And um, 
but when it, when it um, decays, the next daughter isotope is, uh, is, is a radon atom. And radon is a gas which has a very short half-life. So it comes up in your basement, and if you breathe it, <coughs> some of it is going to decay in your lungs. And when that decays, it gives off, I believe, I could be wrong here, it gives off alpha radiation. It may be that the daughter isotope of it, which is radon, gives off alpha radiation. But at any rate, there is the possibility of alpha radiation happening inside your lungs. And alpha radiation is extremely destructive if it happens inside you. So with burning coal and having that soot in the atmosphere, we are... Well, you, can, you get a lot of stuff in the atmosphere from coal. Mercury, is, historically, is the reason mm -hmm. why we've had problems with, and with uh, water in Vermont. The, the, it's the reason why you're, you're not allowed to fish in some areas. In some areas, you're allowed to fish, but you're not allowed to keep the fish mm -hmm. because you, you shouldn't be eating them because they've got too much mercury. And you really have to find out anywhere you are in Vermont or New Hampshire how much mercury there is in the water if you're fishing because the fish can have the mercury in them. And that mercury doesn't all come from coal, but almost all of it comes from coal. And it, you know, it's, it's part, I think it's part of the problem that we have with, with laws and, and you know, the social contract, tract, if you will, because this comes from coal that was burned to benefit people in Pennsylvania, New York State, Ohio. Vermont didn't get anything out of that except the mercury. Oh, we got something. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but there there are a lot of problems with coal and the 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 ash. There was a there was a spill a couple of years ago where a dike holding uh, coal ash back broke and it spilled into a river and it, it's just it's the coal ash is nasty stuff. Mm -hmm. It's not as nasty as some things out there, but it's not good. Anyway. January 11th, according to um, NPD analysts, new PV installations in the United States throughout 2013 reached a record of 4.2 gigawatts. This figure is a 15th percent growth on the 2012 figures and places the country in a leading solar position outside the Asia-Pacific region. Now, I'm going to ask people just to remember that we hit that particular news item because we're going to be hitting <coughs> more news items farther down that relate to that. And it's, this is an interesting combination. So what is the percentage <coughs> of, of power that is, or do you just have the 42 we'll get to gigawatts? That. Okay. We will get to that. Okay. Okay. Uh, next item, a look at peer-reviewed articles on climate change in scientific journals from November 12th, 2012 to December 31st, 2015, found 2,258 articles written by a total of 9,136 authors. Obviously, I have multiple authors writing th these articles. Only one article by a single author rejected man made global warming. And interestingly enough, <coughs> we'll see. There's proof. Yeah. <laughs> that author, I, I I looked into this a little further. That author was writing in Russia, and he said, "We can't have global warming because we, if we do, it's going to destroy this in the Russian economy." <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I mean, there's a little bit of a side <coughs> interest there. Okay, opinion. All right. And this goes back to this, this previous thing. I, I said, there's more coming. Here it is, part of it. Deceiving Energy Information Administration forecasts. Now, this is the U.S. DOE's Energy Information Administration. This is a letter from Clean Technica readers. The Energy Information Administration forecast is that we will reach 0 0.45 gigawatts of solar PV on the grid by 2035, <laughs> which is a tenth of the amount that was installed last year. <laughs> but in November, we reached 7.11 oh, uh, 7 gigawatts, according to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, which is also part of the DOE. <laughs> These forecasts, I think we have to make clear, they're not forecasts. They are they are reference lines. 
and they assume a bunch of things, and they're oh, quite open about, it, about what they're assuming in many cases. They assume things that are clearly not going to happen. Um, and one of the things that they assume is that no laws will be changed and no new laws will be passed. So we, you know, tell your congressman that if he's going to vary from that, he's, we're going to have a problem with solar installations. <laughs> <laughs> Are we doing well here? January 12th, the EPA proposed standards to limit dangerous car carbon pollution from new power plants will be published in the government official newspaper, the Federal Register, kicking off a, which is, by the way, the most boring um, newspaper I have ever read, kicking off a 60-day period of public comment, and the online version is already available. If you go to geoharvey.wordpress.com and look at the January 12th um, entry, you will find that, and you can get to it very easily by clicking on the, on the calendar, which you'll see on the left side of the screen. Um, so you can comment on that if you wish. <clears throat> Next, a, a report identifying 9,300 megawatts of potential new sites of hydro-generated electricity in northern Ontario says water power expansion will help remote First Nations get rid of their outdated diesel-powered stations. And I'd be interested in knowing what, what kinds of, of uh, hydro they're, they're projecting there. I tried, I tried looking it up and I didn't see, but I was thinking it might be microhydro. Jason, do you know about microhydro? I do. It's cool stuff. Well, it's much less disruptive to the environment. You're not putting up big dams that change fish flows and water flows. You're just tapping into smaller percentages yeah. very effectively and yeah. at much lower cost. Um, there's, a, there's a company in, it might be Vermont, might be New Hampshire, called Little Green Hydro, a guy named James Perkins. Do you know him? I've, I've heard the name. You've heard the name. Um, and he has an inlet for, for a hydro system that is a screen angled at about 45 degrees, and it's, it's smooth. You can run your hand on this, and there's, no, there's nothing there to catch your hand. And fish can actually swim up the, river, the stream over this thing. Hmm. And it's, it's put in a stream so that when the stream is low, there's no water into, going into it, so that the generation just shuts down, so that the uh, wildlife are, are preferred over, over power generation. But the, if you've got a good-sized head, it does not take very much water to turn a, turn a turbine. Um, wind energy company, I don't know how to pronounce this, Ogin, O-G-I-N, Inc., is seeking approval to install 40 of its shrouded turbines at Altamont Wind Resource Area, a wind farm with unusually high numbers of avian deaths, to test its theoretically more bird-friendly turbine design. This is an interesting concept. I looked up what these shrouded turbines were, so I wasn't quite sure. And they're what you might expect, turbines with a shroud around the outside mm -hmm. of them. And that led me to some other places where to study in turbines. Mm -hmm. There's some concepts for turbines out there that are so far <laughs> out, I wouldn't figure they'd even work. Yeah. So we got people all over the world, bright guys, looking at different ways. And you're going to see a lot more vertical axis turbines yeah. than we have now. Yeah. And shrouded turbines, they actually find these shrouded turbines are more efficient, at so least I under certain wind conditions. So I understand. And, uh, you know... Wind turbines have been around, or windmills have been around, what, since 1600 or something oh, like that? before that. They haven't changed much. <clears throat> yeah. You know, they're bigger, the, the, the blades are different, but basically it's the same concept. They had a very nice little structure at the bottom and hollow. Oh, yeah, they were neat, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but now there's people out there looking at this afresh, anew, you know, and mm -hmm. they're going to come up with some new concepts that are really going to change the wind turbine industry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've, I've taken a look at helical turbines, and some of these are very small, you know, like yeah. 10 kilowatts, not very big things. But they are, because they're vertical, they don't care what direction the wind is coming right. in. Right. Which, of course, the big, tall, fan-shaped things do. 
And that means that you can mount these things in area that where there's a lot of turbulence. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you could mount them on, on, a, on a building in a city and the, the wind is constantly changing. It doesn't care. And when you look at them, they look like some sort of weird decoration. Yeah. <laughs> they really do. But they're certainly not something a bird would fly into. I did see a little presentation right here in town by yeah. some guy that's pushing these little, little helical turbines. Yeah. And uh, his model had four of these on the four corners of the house. Yes. And just like you said, it looked like some sort of decoration. Yeah. I've, I've wondered what, what it would look like if you had the, 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 the wall around the top of the parking garage have, have these things positioned every once in a while down there. The similar technology works with um, collecting tidal power. So they don't have yeah. to worry about the, the direction of the current or wave power where you have the flowing back and forth okay. and they catch that energy in both directions. Yeah. I understand that up in the Bay of Fundy, Canada is doing uh, a test study and they expect to generate a very substantial amount of energy if from you tidal power. Think about the tides up there. The, I, I don't know, but it, I, you know, if you could capture all of the energy in those tides, I would think it would power North America. <laughs> what is it, something like a 70-foot tide? Something like that. Twice a day it goes in. Twice a day it goes out again. Yes. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's true. I think it might be the tallest tide I think in it's the, the tallest in the world. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. Okay, January 13th, renewable energy in the typhoon-battered Philippines archipelago received a boost as the government issued green light for several proposed wind and hydro power plants, some of these, by the way, were, were micro-hydro, as part of efforts to become 100% powered by renewables within a decade. Now, they got hit by that typhoon, and they said, you know what, if, if, we, had, if we had distributed power, distributed power really takes on a different meaning when you're, everybody lives on an island. Mm. It's more resilient. Yeah, it's more resilient. That's the point. And after this typhoon, they're going to have to replace most of the power infrastructure anyway. Right. Probably most of the lines are down, most of the generation is damaged. Yep. If you're going to put money into it, why not put in money in the state of the art that gives them the independence and renewability? That is an extremely good point. You have to spend the money r replacing the infrastructure. And even, you know, if the infrastructure is just getting old, you know, and we're having people at, at places like Morgan Stanley saying, well, why would anybody invest in, in, um, in fossil fuels or nuclear when, when uh, <laughs> yeah. All right, there are early signs of consensus as discussion is underway in Vermont's House Natural Resources and Energy Committee. The committee is considering lifting limits on the amount of power connected consumers may contribute to the grid. You have an opinion on that, Jason? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, it's it's an interesting scenario because I certainly believe that the uh, that every citizen should have the right to be able to generate their own power mm -hmm. and being able to feed that back into the grid uh, to as opposed to having to have your own batteries makes it much more efficient and effective. It also helps take care of grid demand where the power is being generated. Uh, from many different points a more distributed generation mm -hmm. as opposed to a single source. So that makes the grid more resilient. Uh, but also it's important that, that you know, if people can take control of the power generation themselves, it gives people independence. Right. And that it's so important, in my opinion, to let people be able to be energy independent and not depend on energy technologies which are supporting wars around the world or pollution which is or, also heading or around big the world. companies or major companies that don't really you know their concern is the bottom line and not necessarily the welfare of the people who are consuming their products mm -hmm. and interestingly enough the people who oppose these things in the United States are claiming to be free market capitalists <laughs> who are supporting the American democratic dream and it just seems like that is one of the most ludicrous things I've ever come across <laughs> well, <laughs> well, capitalism, true capitalism requires a free and open market, not yes. protectionism that makes it so that only the big power producers are allowed to get Bingo. in and compete. Yes. So that's anti-competition and anti 
uh, free market. It's, it's not a free, market, not a free market. Anti-democratic. The solar, I think, is one of the most democratic things I've seen come, come along, and they're opposed to it. And of course, in, in Vermont, you can have community wind. And you can have, and this, this, yeah. So to, to come back to that, one of the things that I would like to see uh, in the energy generation, the small distributed power, uh, at this point we have net metering, which is definitely a step in the right direction. As a producer of power, I can generate my own power and I can apply it to my own meters. Uh, but it should be that people should be able to go beyond that. That's to some extent a convoluted system. I either have to have my own meter uh, to uh, consume what I generate or a group of meters, but that's a lot of bureaucracy. Ideally, what should happen is I should be to some extent on par with any other producer out there and be paid for what I generate. Yes. That would be instead of net metering where I have to juggle offsetting that with my consumption somewhere. If I put up a system and just get paid X number of cents per kilowatt for everything I contribute to the grid. If the government is then going to subsidize particular generation, so they, if the government is going to say, well, we really want to help with wind or hydro or solar, then they can uh, put in what is a, would be a feed-in tariff, which means they would contribute uh, a certain number of cents per kilowatt if you're contributing um, photovoltaic as opposed to coal or yeah. however else you go. So that's how they could subsidize it. It should be simpler for the producer to be able to produce and feed their power in. And ideally, um, everybody should be on equal footing to be able to to put their power in. Right. I absolutely agree with that. The one thing that I would, that I would, the kind of very small monkey wrench I'd throw into that work is that you have to have a sense of the current cost of the power. Because if you have everybody throwing power onto the grid at a fixed price, you can drive the wholesale price negative. Well, this is where uh, there is a huge advantage to having a truly smart grid. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. A truly yeah. smart grid would be able to charge consumers based on what the total consumption of power is. So if we're in the middle of a heat wave in the, in the summer and everybody's got air conditioning on and so forth, the demand goes up, then ideally the price of power goes up, up during that yes. particular time frame. And if we have smart appliances or consumption, it might mean that okay, you're going to have your freezer go off when it's at the most expensive uh, rate because it'll be back on in a couple of hours and your freezer will be fine. Or if you have an electric car, you're only going to charge at the off-peak rates, which are the lowest right. rates. Right. So as the consumption is moderated by the price fluctuations, that will help bring the consumption down. Right. And as a producer, if I am able to produce energy and, and feed it in during the highest demand, Ideally, if that same sunny day I have a solar installation that is feeding power in, I should be able to get a higher rate for the power that I put in. And if I have a micro hydro that is delivering energy into the grid at midnight when it's not worth as much, okay, we're not getting as much for that power. Right. But to have a grid that can both charge and compensate between the consumers and the producers, that would help make it so the grid works more effectively, people get compensated more justly for what they produce, and they pay more appropriately for what they consume. And the whole thing becomes more stable than it is. All yes, of this is in the process of happening as we speak. That's mm -hmm. right. It will happen yes. no matter what we well, do the, here the about question it. Is how it just much, makes sense. Yeah, the question is how much, how much damage is going to be done by people who are opposing it. Well, they or, will do damage. They're going to they're they're try. try, but we'll they're not going to win. Yes, I think you know that's they're, true. They're, they're doing something that I can't talk about on TV. Into they the are, wind. They, they <laughs> remind me a little bit of the of the story of a Persian emperor who was trying to invade Greece, and and his fleet crossing the Dardanelles got destroyed by the sea in a in a in a storm, and so he had his his um, his uh, people who were in charge of punishments go down and whip the sea. Well, that works. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> you know, it's, it's, they're working against the tide, and it's going to be destructive primarily to them. And all of these uh, calculations, all these different prices of power, are known right now instantaneously. It, mm -hmm. It's out there. The information's yeah. out yeah. there. Yeah. It's just not being utilized in a way that will benefit everybody. But, and it will be and, eventually. And it will be a benefit to everybody, because, it, because if the grid is stable and it's dependent upon, uh, upon the most efficient way to do things, that, which is what we're working toward, then people's power prices are going to go down. And when the, you know, people don't realize this, um, and I've, I've gone through this several times on the show and, and in the blog, the, the archaic approach to the grid is, is a very bad match to grid demand. And they are being told that you need storage in order to deal with solar and wind because they're intermittent. But the fact is, Northfield Mountain Station, which has an output of 160% of Vermont Yankee, was built at the same time as Vermont Yankee in order to make up for the fact that Vermont Yankee was a bad match to the grid demand. <laughs> and, and now what we're doing is we're coming into a system where things can be dealt with under computer control on a smart grid, and we can have a more stable grid. And that, what that means is retail prices for power, on average, can go down. Well, part of it is because we don't have to build massive power generation things like Vermont Yankee yes. or major dams or yeah. coal plants. Those are huge capital expenses. Yes, and as a matter of fact, there was a very interesting article. I don't remember whether it was in the last week or the previous week about a, uh, law, a, a court case in Minnesota where the judge looked at the figures and he said, yeah, solar power is cheaper than natural gas. We're going to go with solar. And the cheapest power that we have in the United States right now is long-term contracts on wind. And the second cheapest is long-term <laughs> contracts on biofuel that's coming from biodigesters. Bio you know, and, and solar has gone cheaper than coal and nuclear. And now this judge is saying solar is cheaper than, than natural gas for exactly the reason that you decided. You only need to build as much of it as you need. Mm -hmm where if you're building a natural gas plant, you need to build a, you know, a multi, 400, I think it was 400 or 450 megawatt natural gas plant they were talking about. And he said, if we only need 100 megawatts, we don't need to build something that big, and we can put in 100 megawatt worth of solar. So, yeah. And I credit the economy and the dollar value of uh, providing energy with being the reason that Vermont Yankee is shutting down. Uh, what they said in their announcement is that it was not economically viable. So with all the legal challenges we've had for years, it was the economy is what finally closed it down. The right. competition is great enough that it is cheaper to buy elsewhere yes. uh, to buy the power. Yeah. So it's not cost effective for them to continue. Well, you remember the great deal they were going to give Vermont, which was six and a half cents per kilowatt hour on half of what we needed from them plus market rate on the other half. And the people at the, at the, you know, who were negotiating this for Vermont said, why would we do that when we can get all of it for six cents from, from Hydro-Quebec? And in fact, when Vermont has got the ability to, to um, generate at least 1,200% of what it needs um, from solar, wind, biomass, and, and um, hydro, and there are other sources coming along, like geothermal might contribute another 600% to that or something. We've got a lot of ability to deal with this stuff. All we've got to do is put it in. When we do that, I would like to have a really close look taken at the question of resilience. Towns that can separate themselves from the grid so that their own production facilities can continue to operate after Hurricane Irene has gone through, you know, and Here's Wilmington, for crying out loud, was without power for a couple of weeks, right next to Searsburg, which has a population mm -hmm. of 100 and 6 megawatts of, power, of, of, of capacity. So here's where the smart grid could be even more effective. In a scenario <coughs> like that, where you create these power islands, yes. you mm -hmm. get cut off, and so, all right, you isolate a community, and when you have a certain amount of generation within that, you then be shift it to being the highest, uh, the most expensive power at that time, which ideally all the appliances that, that need 
uh, that wouldn't use power on that level would shut down. So you're only supporting the most important with that power right. that is available. Absolutely. Maybe you have an emergency category of yes. power production in that case, yes. uh, which is above the sort of peak demand, right? Uh, which shuts down everything except what is absolutely necessary so to your, run. Your furnace keeps going, your refrigerator keeps going, your freezer keeps going, and your radio, but not your TV, perhaps. Oh, we've got to have the TV. Uh, I mean, a lot of this is going to depend upon, <laughs> because these smart grid things can operate, a person can decide for himself what's important. Mm -hmm. But, you know, these, I think we're I think we're moving into an era where people have got better options. Than well, with to. that decentralization, as you described, the Searsburg was right next to Wilmington. If the if the grid is designed properly and able to isolate that which can continue to operate with the areas that urgently need that power, as opposed to just having no power mm -hmm. with all that production nearby, they could take advantage of it. It's coming. It's, it's coming. coming. Yeah, it's well, coming. Well, that's the resilience. Yeah, it's coming. Okay. January 14th, South Korea said that it revised down its re future reliance on nuclear power to 29% of the power supply in 2035, as opposed to what it had planned, which was 41% by 2030. The country's nuclear power is now providing 26 percent as of the end of 2012. In other words, they're exp ex expecting to have a very modest increase. And quite frankly, I wonder whether that's going to happen. Well, as I read that, I, I'm scratching my head a little bit about it, and I wonder if that increase is based on plants that are already under construction not, but not producing yet. That's an interesting point. Yeah, that's an interesting point. In April 2011, one month after the onset of the disaster at Fukushima Daiichi, demonstrators staged a sit-in outside the head office of Kyushu Electric Power Company. On January 14th, <coughs> the activists marked the 1,000th day of their sit-down protest. Dedicated people. Dedicated people. Well. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Former Prime Minister Prime Minister Hosokawa, who is aiming uh, is aiming to remake a, uh, Japan a nuclear free country, says he is backing former Prime Minister Juni, Junichiro Koizumi. Sorry, I'm, I I know I'm pronouncing these wrong. <laughs> but, <clears throat> and I'm sure my my non-Japanese speaking public doesn't mind. <laughs> um, uh, Anti-nuclear advocate as he runs in next month's Tokyo gubernatorial election. The guy's running for the, pr the governor of the Tokyo prefecture. And he's, he is running on a platform of no nuclear. And the prime minister of Japan is saying, that is not appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, there it is. <clears throat> now, here's a good one, and this expands on, on something that we had talked about before. The world's 48 leading fossil fuel companies will be asked to run a, quote, climate stress test, end quote, at a summit hosted at UN headquarters in New York. And this is organized by a nonprofit organization. You know that there's something big going on here. U.S. Carbon Business Group Series, which is the nonprofit based in Boston, with a network of in investors worth $12 trillion, that is trillion with a T, it is not a mistake, is organizing the event. These people are starting to realize that climate change and global warming are a serious financial threat, and they want to have those people who are causing it face it. Let's put it that way. What is a stress test? I don't know. For that? <laughs> I don't know. And I looked for the, uh, this, was, this was on the 13th, uh, 14th, and I looked in the news today to see what happened as a result of that, because it did take place, and I saw stuff saying it did take place, <laughs> but it, nobody has gone into the details very deeply yet. There's a little bit coming on that. Um, okay. Vermont law, this is on the 15th. 
Vermont lawmakers are considering a plan to tax the state's natural gas pipelines to fund renewable energy projects. The new taxing scheme could raise millions for renewables as gas lines are expanding in the western side of the state. There are a lot of people who are opposed to those gas lines because the gas going into them is coming from fracking fields. On the other hand, <clears throat> I, actually, I have to say, um, one of the organizations, I think is Middlebury College is in favor of the pipeline, not because they want to use natural gas from the pipeline, but because they have farms that are next to the pipeline, and they want to put gas from biodigesters into the pipeline so they can take them out at the college. Oh, interesting. Okay. I, mean, there's, <laughs> they... <laughs> I wouldn't have expected that. Well. Yeah, but, you know, it's, it's, um, we've got an ability to make what is called syngas or uh, synthetic gas. And we've talked about that too, town gas. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's an old concept it's that's an old been thrown concept. away and now they're bringing it off the they're shelf and dusting it, it off that's again. That's right. Well, is that what they're trying to do up at the landfill here? Create, uh, pull methane off? That's, yeah. Or is that different? It's basically the same kind of technology. They are, yeah, that's right. That was Carbon Harvest that was doing that. That was Carbon yeah. Harvest. And they I don't know what all became of that. I know that there was... They went bankrupt. There was a bankruptcy yeah. involved, and they moved to Rutland, and I'm very sad the about The concept was great, the concept but they couldn't pull it together. Yeah. And I think yeah. somebody sort of bought the the what was left over from that. So something is happening there. I mean, that it wasn't just walked away look into that. Well, they built a lot of the facilities there already. They so, had a greenhouse. Yeah, and, and they, they were going to raise, it was a beautiful concept. They were going to raise fish. Yeah. They were going to raise vegetables. So the fish were going to eat the vegetables. They were going to uh, the sell the fish. Were, fish were going to supply waste to waste fertilize to, the to, Yeah, it was, it was. It's, a, it's an interesting concept, yeah. as you said. Well, of course, and, the Chinese have been doing something like this for centuries. Well, I've been, I've been looking into aquaponics, which is what this is all mm -hmm. about. And one of the things that I've come across is if you have an aquaponic system which has um, uh, lighting, electric lighting, you can get, um, I think it was 20,000 pounds of fish and 40,000 pounds of vegetables per acre from a greenhouse. And that acre. sounds like a lot. That's a lot. Well, an acre is a big area, too. An acre is a big area, but does, your greenhouse doesn't have to be that big. And what it comes down to is 40, uh, 20,000 pounds of fish and 40,000 pounds of vegetables. An acre is, what, 48,000 square feet? Uh, 43,280 or something like that. Okay. But it's but basically it's 220 by 220. Okay. If you can figure out or visualize a football field, it's, an acre is three-quarters of that. Okay. okay, but what that means is you can get a half a pound of fish and one pound of vegetables for every square foot, uh, roughly. Okay. And when you have a greenhouse, which is 200 square feet, which is not huge, that is going to be 50 pounds of fish and 100 pounds of vegetables per year. And that, that's substantial. And, you know, that's not a huge space. That's yeah. something that a lot of people can have attached to their house. I think we should move on here. Um, United Nations Climate Chief Christiana Figueres has urged financial institutions to triple their f renewable energy investments to around $1 trillion per year. And that may have been in conjunction with the thing at the UN. I don't know. The, Did or, that announcement come yeah. after the... It was, it was during the time that Sirius was operating its, its uh, thing at the UN. So it may have been in conjunction or it may have been just that that's it was time for her to do that. I don't know. But, I mean, she has been, um, she's been really adamant about dealing with climate change. And it, it sounds like the people who have got the investments are getting adamant about climate change. Well, it's interesting that announcement happened to come out at the same time that there's an organization representing $12 trillion worth of investors in yes. the same. <laughs> and, same and, of time. course, it's also interesting that Subsidies for fossil fuels, which are causing this problem, are going into $545 billion a year. That's the subsidy for fossil fuels? For fossil fuels fuel worldwide. If you cut that out, it means that the prices of fossil fuels are going to go up. Mm 
but you can take that money that you're using to subsidize fossil fuels, and if you subsidize renewables with that to the same extent, you're going to be ultimately within a very short period of time depressing the price of power. Mm -hmm. which means the, subs the fossil fuel industry is in deep, deep trouble here. And, you know, we've talked about that before. Um, yeah, I have about half a dozen items left here, so... And I know, Jason, you've got something on your mind there, I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> Will you stop reading my mind? <laughs> right. Uh, U.S. Environmental Protection Agency has published a rule requiring oil and gas companies using hydraulic fracturing off the coast of California to disclose the chemicals they discharge into the ocean. There is a law right now that says that they don't have to tell you what they're putting underground, which is, in my mind, sick. But they've, they, I, they, the um, EPA is very upset about that. They want to they review that, and they're saying, we've got to get this under control. We were talking about that last week. Next, and this, this is one that's really interesting. Global investment in renewable energy for 2013 fell 12% from 2012. The second consecutive year of decline. Now, remember earlier mm -hmm. we were talking about the increase in the amount of solar that was put in and stuff? This is very, very bad news for fossil fuels and nuclear because it means what's happening is the, the capacity being installed is increasing, but the investment is decreasing. The cost of that mm -hmm. investment is That's going down. That's exactly right. The cost of it going, is going down faster than, it, than, than, um, than um, the, 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 the cost is going down faster than the decline in investment. And, and this means that huge pressure is being put on the fossil fuel and nuclear industry. Mm -hmm. And the pressure is just getting worse. This is not, I mean, it's not delightful news to the renewable industry to see investment decline, but it's far, far worse for, for their competition. Much of the decline was due to technological advances that were driving down fuel costs and making clean power more affordable. And a lot of that is because the Europeans are investing huge amounts of money into solar, and the, the, bo the bottom dropped out of the price of solar. Well, it's an economy of scale. They're producing them in such large quantities that they cost less to produce. For anybody who doesn't understand economy of scale, it works this way. This is Yankee ingenuity. We lose money on every item, but we make it up on the volume. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, here are two items that are together, and one of them is power generated by photovoltaic systems covered 4.5% of Germany's total electric supply last year, 4.5%, according to estimates released by the German Association of Energy and Water Industries. The next one, which goes right along with that, in two th and this is really impressive, in 2013, wind generation provided 33.2% of Denmark's electric consumption, which is especially in in interesting when you consider that it was only about two years ago that the power companies were saying, no, you can't go, you can't have wind at upwards of 20%. It'll destroy the grid. <laughs> well, that's not what happened. And in fact, in December, they broke, they broke the record for the amount of uh, percentage of electric consumption that was supplied by wind for the month, and they, the old record, I don't know what the old record was, but this is the first time they had more than half, and they went to almost 55% of the electric supply in Denmark was being produced by their wind. Now, money was not being exported for oil that, went, that was being covered by wind. Money was not being exported for coal, it was being covered by wind. Money was not being exported for power that came from hydro dams in Norway or Germany because it was being covered by wind. The Danes have got, have got this in a situation where they're starting to make out like bandits. And they've got parts of Denmark. The, the island of Samsø is powered 100% by wind. So they must have some method of storing, or is this sort of a uh, just they have being able some to storage. feed it into the I grid? should say they do have 
uh, backup power, mm -hmm. uh, which is supplied by diesel, which is powered by straw. <laughs> <laughs> is it really? Yeah, yeah, it's powered by straw. Yeah. And uh, this is interesting because these people don't just grow straw, you know, and say, ah, well, we can use it for whatever. They have got two crops that are on Samsa that are really interesting. One of them is strawberries. And people from all over Europe go to this little island to pick strawberries for va their vacations. But the other one is, is potatoes. They grow potatoes. Samsa's new potatoes, when they get to the market in Paris, can fetch over $100 a pound. Wow. Can, I mean, can must you, be good potatoes. Must be. <laughs> Wow. Just a little clarification there. Yeah. In, in European parlance, straw is much more than just hay with the seeds taken off. It's all crop residue is called straw. I had, I had read that. I had yeah. forgotten that. So if we were using um, corn stalks from, from maize. They'd call it straw. They'd call it straw. Yeah. yeah. And the leaves too, I think. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So that's, and that's an important thing. And we can use a lot of, uh, you know, switchgrass, hemp. Um, there are a lot of things that you can use for this. And the last item on the agenda for today, and then we can get to uh, Jason's concerns. Are we going to get back to the FIT? Um, I'm not reading your mind. No. Okay. <laughs> TEPCO won support for the, uh, of the government and banks for a plan to rebuild its business, the latest step in the recovery of after the Fukushima di disaster. The plan includes restart of two reactors at the Kashiwazaki Kariwa nuclear plant as early as July. Now, the one thing that I want to point out about this, because it was all over the news today, is that the agreement does not include permission to start the reactors. What it includes is that their restart is an important part of a fiscal plan. And if they can't get a restart on the reactors, then the fiscal plan is useless. But it doesn't give them permission to restart the reactors. They can't get that from the government uh, where, they, where they made this agreement, which was the government and the banks. They have to get that from the uh, nuclear, nuclear, what do they call it, nuclear uh, regulation agency or whatever it is that they, that they have, NRA. Um, and it's, it's um, so I, I think people might have thought, some people might have thought that that included permission. It doesn't. And the, and the news reports didn't say that. <laughs> mm. So, you know, anyway, you had something you wanted to mention. So two things. One is I could um, say one more thing about uh, the feed-in tariffs. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> you... Uh, you spoke at one point about how people predicted that as you do this distributed power, it'll destroy the grids. Yes. And one of the concerns which uh, has manifested in Vermont is as more and more um, renewable power has come online, uh, some of the smaller power companies have expressed concern that they're not generating the revenue they need to, to maintain the power lines, to maintain that grid. And... Uh, so, because they're paying out more for their power. So, uh, one of the things to be aware of is that s somewhere the money has to come from to maintain that grid because all of this renewable power, whether it's being able to create islands, whether it's being able to feed in, mm -hmm. all, of, all of that grid is critical to the infrastructure of being able to get people the power they need. So that grid, grid has to be maintained somehow. There has to be some revenue coming in for that. Yes. Uh, Green Mountain Power, to the best of my knowledge, is not a power producer. They are purely the grid management. They are the organization that buys power from somewhere and delivers it to somewhere else. Right. So somewhere there has to be a piece in that that they collect to be able to support that grid. Right. And so when you look at the, uh, the smart grid, where mm -hmm. there's different costs and prices uh, for power coming in and going out. And 
uh, if you're going to have a feed-in tariff, somewhere in all of that, there has to be a piece that goes to support that grid. Because yes. Because that's a crucial piece. That's a crucial piece. And one of the things that I've been thinking, and you know, there's the, the Vermont legislature, the, I'm sorry, it's not the legislature, it's the, it's the Department of Public Service is, uh, is getting comments um, right now. Uh, the period, comment period is about to end. It's only a few days hence about um, how we move forward to get renewable power. Um, the islands that you were talking about, which are going to be microgrids or mini grids, um, I've been giving a lot of thought to that and the fact that they should be, um, first of all, capable of producing their own power, clearly, and capable of detaching themselves from the grid. But they should have some resource, other than the, the grid itself, other than the grid, for attaching themselves to similar operations in neighboring communities. So other than the grid? Other than the grid. We should have well, a... Be another grid. It would be a second grid, but it doesn't need the grid infrastructure because the amount of power being, being moved would be um, small. small compared to the regular grid. But it would, it would give those... Um, it would give Searsburg the capability of sending power to Wilmington. And mm -hmm. Wilmington the, the capability of, of getting power also possibly from Marlboro. And Marlboro the, the opportunity to get power from Brattleboro. And, and you know, we're talking about a sharing thing here. And if this were fully fleshed out with a smart grid, with that ability to, for in, communities to support each other, if the grid goes down for two weeks, Vermont could be up and running the next day. Mm -hmm. The whole state, well, with the exception of Lewis. Lewis is... <laughs> <laughs> it's a town in the Northeast Kingdom with a population of zip. <laughs> well, how much power do they consume? <laughs> I have no idea. But per capita, you're talking about per zero. We're <laughs> Isn't this infinity? <laughs> I think so, yeah. Those bears have to watch out what they're doing in the woods. Yeah, they do. They might run into... No. <laughs> There's an old saying about the Pope. <laughs> Is the Pope Catholic? That wasn't the one I was thinking of. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> anyway, yes, and you, you had something else, Jason. I'm sorry I've diverted this badly. No, that's fine. Uh, I, I have an article that I came across, which oh, good um, for you. I don't know if uh, we want to get into this or not, but this is uh, a publication called Clean Technica, and um, the, the article is titled A Science Smackdown. It's Key Points on Renewable Energy and the EV Revolution. And what it talks about is how there are, there's a lot of misinformation out there. Boy, is there ever. And uh, the, the people who claim they want free markets, so they're setting up protectionist uh, things yes. to protect <laughs> their particular market and not necessarily the free market. Yes. So here's some of, uh, see if I can read through this, uh, some of the points that they make in terms of wind, water, and sun. The best, over solution, best overall solution to global warning, deadly pollution, and reliable energy needs and disaster protection. They talk about battery and electric vehicles are a key transportation solution four to five times more efficient than internal combustion engines for powering your car. The best way to reduce energy consumption is to use an electric vehicle. Uh, or even better would be a bike or your own two feet. Uh, and they say, why not nuclear? Uh, nine to 25 times more pollution per kilowatt than wind and the risk of meltdown. Um, and then the risk of nuclear weapons proliferation and unresolved waste issues. Why not coal? 50 times more CO2 emissions per kilowatt. 50? 50 times more emissions than wind, per kilowatt yeah. than wind. 150 times more air pollutants emissions uh, per kilowatt. Uh, let's see, what was that again? 150 times more air pollutant emissions than wind per kilowatt, uh, requires 25% more energy, and thus 25% more coal mining uh, and transport and related uh, pollution problems. So this article goes down through uh, several pieces of that. It's very interesting information when you look. This gives you the hard numbers of 
you know, the comparison between Ooh. wind and solar. It's going down to the basic cost, what it costs to get it out of the ground, what to get it from here to there. Well, it goes down to the cost in terms of pollution, it, yeah. uh, in terms of the CO it's putting out, and the cost of... of when they're mining energy. it, for example. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 I know that Which you've got to take into consideration if you're going to be fair. Correct. And I know that uh, some of the critics of electric vehicles have said, oh, well, you have to look into the political costs of the mining of the lithium for the batteries and <laughs> the pollution that goes into manufacturing those well, batteries yeah. and the energy that goes into that, the cost of the batteries and then the, the disposition of them afterwards. Those are all valid points Absolutely. in terms of the cost of the creation of the vehicles and, and the use of them. But those same people who look at that don't look into, in terms of oil, the political costs of securing oil, uh, yeah. the dollar costs, the pollution costs. What does it cost in CO and pollution to refine those oils Absolutely. and the damage in terms of the spills? There's a huge number of costs to those, and I've never seen that kind of analysis in what it costs <laughs> to deliver those products. So and those they're missing something they're not even mentioning, it's the military costs of that. Which we have we to protect the ship blades. How much are we paying for, for the military to protect? Saudi Arabia. Uh, well, protect Saudi Arabia, yeah. or many of those countries. I mean, Absolutely. We didn't really protect uh, Sudan until it became an issue of the oil fields. <laughs> Isn't you know, that interesting? The civil wars were fine, no problem, <laughs> until, wait a minute, they're starting to interfere with the, uh, with the oil deliveries and shipments yeah. out of there. So now, suddenly, there's more interest. That's a bit cynical, and I'm sure it's not that I, I have no doubt, you know, not being a cynic myself, and I'm not, but I have no doubt that that's correct. It is cynical. Uh, but I agree with it, despite the fact that it's in <laughs> Well, these are all valid costs. They're all Somebody's valid paying costs. for them. Somebody <laughs> is paying for them, and basically it's a tax <clears throat> Now, the nuclear thing, the cost of nuclear, excuse me, <clears throat> the cost of nuclear power in terms of carbon emissions, um, there's a, there was an excellent document that was put together, I think, I'm going to say four years ago, by a, a guy named Benjamin Sovacool who at the time it was put together was a professor, I think he was in a university in Singapore. But today he's a professor at the Vermont Law School, <coughs> among other things that he does all over the world. But uh, he did an excellent thing on where he just looked at studies of nuclear power and he said, I'm going to accept the studies that have these criteria answered. And, and figure out what the costs are, are based on those studies. And then he, I don't know how many there were, there might have been 10 or 15 uh, that, that answered his criteria. And the amount of, of um, pollutants that nuclear was, was releasing in those various studies ranked it as being equal to wind at the low end to about 30 times wind at the high end. 25 times. Pollutants? The carbon dioxide, CO2, and the, and the uh, other things. The wind power requires a certain amount of electricity and, and even oil to, to it make a wind turbine because the, the, the blades of the turbine, for example, are made out of, out of uh, uh, materials that include oil derivatives. Mm -hmm. But um, when you look at solar, the, the uh, carbon emissions of solar at the time of that study were about five times that of wind because it took a lot of electricity to make solar panels. But as technology was changed, and not, it wasn't just the electricity, it was also there was, a, there was a gas that was being used for doping them, which is extremely destructive in terms of climate, uh, uh, global warming. And, um, but the, the, the new technology for solar has brought that down and if you use solar to produce the electricity to make the solar, then the, the carbon emissions go almost to zero. And I see that we are rapidly approaching the end of our hour. So I want to thank everybody who has tuned in, tuned into BCTV. Um, I am, uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of a pitch for Green Energy Times. You'll find some of the material we're talking about in the upcoming issue of Green Energy Times or at my blog, uh, geoharvey.wordpress.com. But I want to thank everybody who is um, 
who is getting this uh, show on cable for, for tuning in, as I said, even though they're not tuning. And I think we're going to hang out here and chat for a little while, mm -hmm. as long as we wish. And whoever is on the internet watching this will be able to see that portion. We got 30 seconds left. Where would I get a copy of Green Energy Times? Oh, it's, it, it's distributed for free, and it, it's basically anywhere that you might look for magazines that are free. Like, for example, down in the, in the cafeteria at the co-op. I saw them at the work. Thank you.